this <clears throat> this webinar on mentoring and observation and this is really an instructor's perspective on observation and mentoring that we're going to be discussing. Um, my name is Wendy Zakovic. Um, I've been a cycling instructor for about 14 years and I've been an instructor trainer for about seven years. Today I'm here representing Lifecycle UK who are a cycling charity based in Bristol who are also a recognised delivery centre as well. Um, I work for Lifecycle, but I also work for Bath and North East Somerset Council and uh, have worked for other cycling providers um, as well. Um, one thing which I really love about my work is that I often get the opportunity to travel to other places and go and observe and mentor other instructors. Now, one thing that I started thinking about when I was preparing for this webinar was thinking about my own experiences of being observed. So I've, I've had lots of experience of observing other people and it made me think about my own experiences and made me wonder what everybody else's experiences have been like um, throughout the country. So I've got a few uh, poll questions here to put up. So if we start with the first one, So the first question here is, have you been observed in the past 12 months? Yes or no? Okay, are there any more folks coming in? A few more coming in. Okay, I think I'm going to be finishing off the poll here now. So I think... Um, Jessica, is this uh, poll being shared now? Yes, so everyone can see the results now. Excellent. Great. So 45% of you have and 55% of you haven't. Um, now, it's a slightly strange year, obviously, and everybody's um, lives have been quite disrupt disrupted. So I'm not too surprised that um, it's actually more people who haven't been observed than have been observed. I'm wondering if people know how often cycling instructors should be being observed. Um, it's actually, if, if anybody saw it, uh, the webinar last week, it's at least every year that each of instructors should be getting observed for IQA purposes. But ideally, it should be more than that. Um, so it's quite a, a low number. And I'm curious as well, um, with um, my next poll here, I'm going to be asking you about getting, um, hold on, I'm just going to close that one up, um, about having written feedback from your observation. So this question here, when was the last time you were given written feedback? Was it six months ago, six to 12 months, one to two years, or more than two years ago? If you just have a little... Go on that. Again, we've got quite a mixed picture coming through. Um, so we've had about two thirds of people vote so far. So if you've not voted yet, Some people saying actually never. Um, so if it is never, please put more than two years ago. Although I think Peter makes a good point that not everyone on the, on, on the webinar are, are instructors. We've got a mixture of scheme managers who, who perhaps don't, don't deliver themselves and may not have been um, observed, which, which may skew it slightly. Um, it's, it's hard to tell without knowing exactly who, who's on the call. 
yeah absolutely. equally feedback can come in all forms so um you know perhaps in your role you may not have had a kind of instructor observation or feedback but you will hopefully have had some feedback in in your role regardless of what you do okay i'm going to end this poll here now if that's okay um so it really is quite a a mixed bag with the highest percentage, 30% of people saying that it was more than two years ago that they got that written feedback, um, which is just really interesting um, statistics to see, especially for Bikeability Trust to see here. Um, and um, I mean, I've I thought about my own experiences as an instructor, and certainly I haven't consistently been observed throughout my time as an instructor um, every year, and probably even less so to, to be getting written feedback. Um, about well just over a year ago I had to retrain um, to do my the level three award for the first for sport award um, to be an instructor trainer um, and so that course involved a lot of observation a lot of feedback a lot of self-reflections and it became a really um integral part of what I was doing again so I really had to um, get used to being observed a lot um, before we go any further I'm just going to do one more poll as well um, to make you think about uh, what makes the experience positive or not okay so do you enjoy being observed yes or no or sometimes how do you feel about it If anybody wants to, while you're doing this, put any comments in the chat about what makes your experience positive or not. That's a positive sign. Great, so there's some really good things coming up here in the chat. People saying that observations give you a chance to learn a better way of doing something. Um, other people saying that they always welcome feedback and that there's always something to learn and develop from being observed, no matter how long you have been teaching. And it helps improve current performance. I find them positive and enjoy doing them. These are really uh, positive uh, reflections here in the chat um, which I really agree with certainly I found that this last year I have um, I have um, been observed so many times but I have learned so much <coughs> from the experience <coughs> of being observed um, so often um, in according to this poll here that we've just done, most of you, so over 54%, do enjoy being observed. So it's quite interesting that the, the observations don't seem to be happening quite as much as what they should be, but people are welcoming the observation when it happens. Um, so, um, there's definitely a real push for especially with the new qualifications for self-reflection for peer reviewing and to really help people to continue to develop as an instructor to keep learning um, throughout your you know your time um, as an instructor so always developing and there's there's definitely um, it's really embedded that there is is going to be lots of peer review and observations happening um, Jessica could you do the next slide please we've just got one more poll here about whether oh, you yeah. think you'd benefit from being observed oh sorry yeah um, um, yeah we put that up I'll just launch that now It's a slightly different question um, if you haven't been observed, whether you think you would benefit from it.
And it's great to see that none of you have said no. <laughs> but of course, it is anonymous, so there's no judgment if you do feel that that is the case. Great. So I'm going to just end that poll there. It's really clear result that almost all of you um, feel that you would benefit from being observed. And some people think possibly you might do. OK, so that's that's really good to see that you're open to the idea of it and that you could see the benefits of it. Um, I noticed that somebody here on the chat has said that they are observed every session by co-instructors and every single session is an opportunity for informal peer mentoring between instructors. So this is something that I'm going to talk a little bit about later as well, um, because I, I really agree that that's a very beneficial um, thing to be practicing. So um, if you go on through to the next slide, please, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. The aim today, we're going to consider what mentoring is, why it's useful, what's involved and who can do it. Um, consider mentoring and observation from a cycle instructor's perspective. So really relating it to your work. Um, and we're going to be thinking about these questions. So who can I have the next buttons, please, Jessica? <laughs> Thank you. Why we will be mentoring. Um, and we've already started to see about the, the development ideas from uh, mentoring. Who would be doing the mentoring? Who would who should be being mentored as well, though? Um, what mentoring looks like. So from a really practical point of view, what's involved in doing it? Um, Next one, <laughs> how we do it and also when we would be doing it as well. Okay, so um, hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll be feeling really very reassured about observation and mentoring, which observation can be a bit daunting for people you know you're putting yourself in quite a vulnerable situation in so far as you're you're opening yourselves up but you can learn so much from it and um and hopefully by the end of this session you'll be keen to be observed and mentored some of you might even want to become a mentor yourself so we're just going to have a little look at what mentoring is so this definition here says mentoring is essentially about helping people to develop more effectively it's a relationship designed to build confidence and support the mentee so they're able to take control of their own development and work. Um, so it's really about helping people to become the best of themselves. Um, this quote here underneath says, the greatest good you can do for another is not just to share your riches, but to reveal to him his own. So it's about finding the best of, of other people and really helping them to shine. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Lovely. So we're going to consider the benefits of mentoring, but not just for the mentor, but also uh, for the mentee, but also for the mentor. So as I mentioned, um, I do a lot of mentoring for other people, and I have learned so much from observing others and it also has a whole other range of benefits so perhaps in the chat could you just write down first of all um, any benefits that you can think of for the mentor so what what benefits does a mentor get if anybody could just write in some ideas to learn different methods of delivery, excellent. Highlight areas of development for other people. Spread the be best practice of new ideas. Consistency across the workforce. Uh, force. Um, new ideas and techniques. As it appears, they get feedback on their own performance. Uh, to build someone's confidence. I, uh, I really 
Good idea of timing. Sorry, my chat's moving at the same time. Uh, okay, I think I'm going to pause you on that for the moment because it's making it move too quickly for me. <laughs> um, so I've got different ways to deliver. Understanding across instructors, can see a person's gap in their knowledge, feedback on scheme processes, and ensuring that mentee acting to standard satisfies employer grow in experience to understand where instructor needs to improve for the better. Great, so we've kind of got a bit of a mixture here of um, the benefits for the mentor and the mentee. Um, it's also the organization as well who would benefit. Um, if we carry on to the next slide, because this shows that it's really quite a reciprocal relationship between the mentor, the mentee, and also the organization. So these are some other ideas that I've uh, come up with. So for example, um, increased motivation, it can really make um, both the mentor and the mentee feel value, valued in their work. Um, they feel supported knowing that there's somebody to help them, to guide them, to go with for questions. Um, job satisfaction. So the mentor might feel job satisfaction that they're being challenged, that they um, are developing themselves as well and can help in a more leadership role. But also for the mentee, they can get a huge sense of satisfaction as well because they're um, they're developing their own skills as well <clears throat> and identifying their own development areas. Uh, there's challenge and stimulation. They feel valued by employers. They feel like the people that they work for care about them. They're in a situation where they're able to share knowledge um, and that the, the, the mentee has somebody to go to to ask about more experience or any anything that is concerning them, anything that they're unsure about, that they've got somebody that they can turn to. Um, they're able to discuss ideas. Um, and this can be for the mentor and the mentee. <clears throat> and overall, there's a huge development of skills, which really benefits not just the uh, mentee, but also the mentor and also the organization as a whole. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Great, so what makes a great mentor? Here we've got this um, cartoon of uh, this, uh, this guy here. And the lady says, Tom, mentoring is about more than encouraging people to be just like you. So I think it's quite easy to think that the mentor is just the, the leader and everybody else follows them. It's not about that. It's about, as we said, trying to get the best out of everybody to try and help them develop to their own personal best. Um, so um, in the chat function, if we just spend a couple of minutes to discuss what makes a great mentor, what sort of, and you can keep these ideas quite general. So, pop in some ideas. Some good things coming in already. Knowledge, empathy, confidence, good listener, good communicator, role model. Lots of listening and communication skills coming up as a common theme as well. Excellent. I'm going to start looking at these. Um, yeah, so we've got experience. I like this one here is also mentioned being a role model as well. Um, and a collaborative mindset, 
which is great because it's so important that you're working as a team when you're um, being a mentor. Communication skills, lots of communication. Good questioning technique, which is a really good point. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later as well. Giving time to listen. I think this is really key because there's listening and then there's really listening. And it's so important that that mentor is listening so clearly that they're picking up on feelings, they're picking up body language, they're picking up on the words that are being said, they're, they're picking up on all sorts of things and listening and tuning in. Um, and you do need to give time for that. Um, focus on details, it gives useful feedback, tactful, this is great. Observation, supportive but development focus. Friendly as well. And again, coming up with time for the debrief and feedback. Being firm if required. So that's interesting. We'll talk a little bit about um, accepting things as a mentee as well. Um, being positive. The knowledge again, um, being able to summarize as well, holistic. Oh, right, we've got lots of things. <laughs> um, uh, so, good listener and communicator, being able to understand the instructor if they have areas to improve that they struggle with, finding the best way for the person to improve. Positive, open, clear, creative feedback. Excellent. Um, I love that this is honest and real feedback. Um, it's so important that it is genuine, the, the, the feedback that we're giving, um, that it's supportive and open. Okay. Great. So I'm just going to um, run through to the next slide here. So again, these are just ideas that I've come up with as well, which to be honest, a lot of these have been mentioned already. Um, I'm just going to see if I can see other ones. Um, mentors provide information as well. So that comes back to the knowledge that they've got enough knowledge to be able to provide information themselves. So at the very least, know where to find that information that you're looking for. They might be able to offer different perspectives. Um, they're being a sounding board. So they're somebody that the that you can talk to without judgment. Um, they encourage self-reflection. So we spoke a lot about asking, um, being able to ask good questions. So that's where that really comes in there. Um, and they help to identify areas of development as well is really um, a key thing as well for their um, progress in development. Uh, somebody else has just popped on as well, sharing good practice as well. Absolutely. And also pointing out options to the mentee. OK, helping them to think of new ideas, perhaps, that they hadn't realised that were possible for them. OK. Um, so perhaps if we move on to the next slide, please. So what I want you to think about here is what mentoring looks like for a cycling instructor. So we've got informal mentoring and then we've got more formal. So perhaps if you could just come up with a few ideas, what does informal mentoring look like? What kinds of things might it be? So it could be something as simple as just at the end of a session, um, just thinking about, um, it says here on the good, um, perhaps you could be thinking about the how, how the session went well and how it could be improved, um, discussing how the sessions are going. Could be a chat during lunch as well. Um, it could be, Afterwards as well, somebody put um, phoning or an, an email for advice. Excellent. So it's peer to peer. That's really what we're thinking of here. Um, and then 
becoming more formal what other types of um mentoring might we see becoming more informal So we've got paperwork, there might be forms and written feedback. So feedback following observation, meetings, it could be recorded. Excellent. Observations by manager, yep, so it might be somebody different like that, rather than the co-instructor. Uh, it might be a personal development review or appraisal or group instructor meetings. Yep. Um, can I um, get the next bits up, please, Jessica? The things that I've... So somebody here has put an EQA, so external quality assurance. Um, so on my slide here, I've got, for the informal, the things we're talking about, peer review. So... With peer review, we spoke about it um, being really can be very informal that you've just got co-instructors perhaps working together um, and you you could just be at the end of the session perhaps discussing what went well, what could be improved. Um, it could be induction for provisional instructors, so new instructors, and they might be paired up with more experienced instructors. But one thing I want you to also remember is that ex yeah, experienced instructors also might be learning from new instructors. And I think that that's particularly true at the moment where a lot of new instructors have just done the first for sport um, level two course. Um, so they will be familiar with things like the e-portfolio and the new delivery guide and just slightly newer ways of doing things. So there will also be lots of new things that even more experienced instructors may learn from the new instructors. And I think it's just really important that they come together and get to discuss their ideas. Um, then you've got things like internal quality assurance and external quality assurance. So the internal quality assurance here, each instructor should re receive as a minimum, so it could be more, um, at least one observation per year. OK, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the internal quality assurance form later on and what that looks like. Um, and then there are other uh, more formal um, types of mentoring, which can include your final assessment. So that could be your recognised prior learning, the RPL. That's for instructors who are converting over into the new first for sport qualification. It could be level two instructors, it could be level three instructors, all having their post-course assessments. So um, these more formal ones, you're definitely having people um, observing rather than just co-teaching and also um, having written feedback as well. Um, so... If we move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, just thinking about um, mentors from cycling in point, um, instructors' point of view, what skills and experience does a cycling instructor need to be a mentor? So we, we looked at mentors more generally, but in particular for a cycling instructor, what extra things would you need be a mentor and I'm thinking more for somebody um, you know who might um, get involved in doing internal quality assurance for other instructors here so what skills and experience might this instructor need nice couple of answers into the into the chat already a uh, good communicator confident and experience experience of delivering across all levels shadowed another mentor mm. 
knowledge and understanding of delivery and the scheme outcomes. And a role model as well, which is a, a nice term from Tina there. Yeah, that's really good because I like that, um, you know, rather than telling people what, how, how they could be improving, you could be leading by example in, and then watching you and learning from that enthusiasm. That's great. Um, knowledge and understanding of delivery and scheme outcomes. That's great that they've got um, a good range of knowledge. So they come up with lots of ideas as well that they can contribute um, for the mentee. Um, what else? Calm Experience. disposition, lovely. Experience of being mentored well themselves. Yeah, that's really interesting one. Yeah, I'd agree. Having learnt skills from that. Um, I like the non judgmental as well, approachable, non judgmental idea. Calm disposition. Mm. <laughs> you're laughing at that <laughs> no it's good um, great and happy to demonstrate as well practical skills so yeah being able to do it themselves I think is really important um, if we move on to the next slide please Jessica you've got some really good ideas there so that's great um, I've just done a few as well that I'm just going to add here so I've said experience of delivering bikeability um, a mentor needs to be confident in their own experience as well um, experience of observing and developing instructors um, if they haven't already got experience then they would definitely need to get training um, in regards to being able to observe others and develop others. So they'd need mentoring training. Um, somebody else had mentioned this as well about excellent understanding of national standard and bikeability delivery guide. Somebody had said something about the um, knowing, knowing about uh, core, core references. Um, and again, coming back to these softer skills about being good listener, asking questions that can challenge the mentee to identify their own course of action that they need uh, for their development and overall this all comes together to create credibility so um, that they've got organization they've got skills they've got trust experience and knowledge that trust is really um, important as well and I think that links back to that non-judgmental um, kind of attitude that they would have Lovely, thank you um, there, Jessica. Perhaps, yeah, go on to the next one. So I'm just gonna give here as a little example. Um, so this is Lifecycle, who I work for uh, in Bristol. Lifecycle, they've got about 50 instructors. Um, and to be honest, they haven't yet set up their IQA mentoring team, but this is their intentions of what they're planning to do. So um, they've got about 50 instructors that they look after. Now, each of these instructors, as we mentioned, need to be observed at least once a year. Um, and so what Lifecycle are planning to do, they want to identify around four instructors who are really experienced, um, who they think would make good mentors, help to train them up, so that they can go around and support um, the rest of the instructors on the team. Um, so when they go and support them, they would be um, observing rather than co-teaching. Um, and they would observe for at least an hour and a half session or more, and then um, make sure that they've got time to give at least half an hour verbal feedback and then fill in the written feedback form, IQA form afterwards. So, um, so that's the kind of um, setup that they are intending to do. In addition to this though, they always um, pair up new instructors with more experienced instructors when they're working together. And that's a really important thing to do. Um, then 
they also are planning to put on their registers a kind of section where they can encourage um, peer reflection where co-instructors together at the end of the session come together and just you know for a short while just talk about what went well in that session and what could have been improved and it just opens up doors to be able to have that communication to be able to talk about how improvements could be made um, so um, so that's the um, the plan that Lifecycle have. Obviously, smaller organisations might struggle to um, to be able to set up a mentoring team. And if that is the case, it might be that they pair up with other organisations, which is um, always a really useful thing to to do anyway. So. Um, that's just kind of ideas and suggestions on how to set up um, your internal quality assurance, mentoring and support. Um, can we have the next one, please? Thank you. So this is a quote here saying, getting the most out of life isn't about how much you keep for yourself, but how much you pour into others. So this is just a quote really just to inspire people thinking about becoming mentors. Um, and, um, oh, um, and here we've got another poll question, if you don't mind um, voting on this here. Do you think you have the skills to be a cycling instructor mentor? Some of you might, some of you not yet, and that's totally fine, but I'm just curious to see what you think. Great, I'm going to close up this poll now. And interestingly, most of you feel that you have the experience to be a mentor, which is, oh, oh, sorry. I think we've got a slightly different poll to what's come up. Can you just help me out here, Jessica? What poll has been? Sorry, I think we've... Uh got the order incorrect uh this is the correct poll apologies for that thank you to all of those who read the question rather than just clicking yes or no <laughs> as as i did <laughs> So, yeah, OK, I'm going to end this poll here and um, share these results. So, yes, most of you feel that you do have the skills to be an instructor mentor, which is really great to hear that you feel confident to be, be able to do that. And I suggest that if people um, aren't being mentored enough, which it seems is the case from the original question, perhaps you could be putting yourself forwards um, to be be trained as an instructor mentor and to help support your team uh, which is as I've said such a beneficial thing to be doing and going back to that other poll which we just had which as you're right the results are still valid I think the majority of people said that yes they do feel that there is somebody uh, I'm just going to share these results here um do you oh hold on is that the wrong poll again there sorry but I think the um oh it keeps coming up there uh that's the yeah. oh sorry i've just stopped sharing that one now uh, share results do you feel you have a mentor to support you as a cycling instructor and actually most of you feel that you do a few of you feel that you don't so that's something worth thinking about how could you find somebody um who could help you as a mentor okay um 
polls coming up all over the place. Right. Um, if we could uh, move on, please, Jessica, that'd be great. I'm going to just pause here for time for any questions. Um, we've had one question um, about who mentors the mentor, um, which I'm not sure if you're going to come, come on to in a minute, but um, obviously you're, you're in a mentoring capacity uh, yeah. yourself, Wendy. Do you want to talk about who mentors you and, and how that process works? Yeah. So, um, you, well, for me, I am a mentor. I'm level three um, instructor trainer. So it's slightly different um, in that I, I'm doing it as an instructor trainer point of view. But for example, um, when I um, did my level three course, I got mentored a lot during that. And then obviously I had my final assessment when somebody came out to visit me, my tutor came out to visit me. I can still, I feel, in fact, my, my tutor is Jackie Easton. And um, I feel like I'm, if I have any worries or concerns, I can go and send them to her questions to her I can I also feel really supported within life cycle to always ask questions uh, with Jackie as well also other instructors there are other tutors as well who come out and observe I've also had lots of uh, external quality assurance and internal quality assurance as well watching um, in terms of um, who mentors other mentors hopefully there would be at least a, cu a couple of you who could mentor so you could mentor each other there's um for example a few of us um instructor trainers at life cycle and we we watch and mentor each other and and uh, have an ongoing conversation as well about how we're how our lessons are going and one thing that i've really enjoyed doing this um last year is it's just we've made it just part of our culture that at the end of every session when we teach we will always stop and think what went well what could we have improved on and constantly improving the work that we're doing okay um I've spotted a question in the chat as well. Um, yeah. Tracy Graham says, is one observation of an instructor enough across the levels and modules? We like to have two visits per year, leaving a term to support those that require additional training. Yeah, I completely understand and agree with that. I would say the more observations, the better. And I think that's true insofar as if they don't happen very frequently, people tend to get really nervous about them and it becomes quite a daunting prospect. The more they have, the more relaxed they are. So more of a kind of natural process it is, but also um, the more support that you're giving. So definitely the more support, the better. Um, in terms of when I'm talking about once a year, I'm saying that that's as a minimum for IQA, internal quality assurance purposes that instructors should be getting. So um, some instructors do need to be observed more than that, even for IQA purposes. For example, if they're new instructors, they should be observed at least two or three times a year. So, um, but yeah, the more um, observations, definitely the better. So if your scheme is doing that, then that's a really brilliant process and um, I wouldn't discourage you from doing it as often as possible. Absolutely I think that's certainly the case from the trust point of view one being the minimum requirement for the year um, and as you say Wendy it, it just makes people more comfortable with the process mm -hmm. as, as it goes through. Yeah. A couple more sort of questions or observations really from, from the, the chat from, from Kate about uh, specific courses for instructors um, uh, with regards to mentoring um, and, and from Greg about uh, the IQA lead um, holding a qualification IQA. Um, so um, similar in that uh, both will fall under sort of further development that we'll be doing uh, in, in the very sort of near future at Trust to better support instructors and, and provide um, IQA leads uh, with with um, resources to uh, to do their jobs uh, really really well. So just watch that this space over the next few um, uh, few months. Yeah, and uh, Carol Booth asks a question about 
Um, as a mentor, how has the riding wheel timing worked out? I think Wendy's coming to that later yeah. in the presentation, so I'll leave that for the moment and we can always come back to it at the end. Yeah, we're going to focus on a couple of different forms um, that get used for mentoring, one of them being the, the IQA form. Um, and so, yeah, I can bring it in then, if that's OK. <laughs> very, very good question, though. Yeah. Well Which done. Like okay. Off. <laughs> OK, lovely. Yeah. Should we um, should we crack on then if that's. Um... I think that's a good point to move on. If you've got any questions that we've missed, can you make sure that you pop them into the Q&A? Um, some of the questions in the chat we we might not have noticed. So if you haven't had your answer, your question answered, just pop it into the Q&A and there'll be uh, time for more questions later on. But yeah, I'll move on now for you, Wendy. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so we're going to be thinking a little bit further about what it looks like to be involved as a mentor. Um, so again, if you could just contribute here, what do you think we need to bring um, to, a men uh, to an observation session if you're observing somebody? If you want to just um, pop a few little suggestions in the, in the chat box, that would be great. Any additional things that we might need to bring as an observer? Knowledge and a plan, I like that. <laughs> um, Pre-planned areas of observation. Yep. Um, um, I'm thinking previous notes. Yep, stopwatch. I like that. Yep, as somebody mentioned, we need to be watching the amount of uh, wheels turning time. Um, some way of taking notes. Absolutely. Now, I personally would recommend the old pen and paper. Um, you might also want to bring out any forms that you'll be using as well, then you could make notes in the relevant places, but it depends how you prefer to take your notes. Anything you might need to take over if an instructor became unable to deliver? Yeah, so essentially you need to bring exactly the same kit as what you would need if you're working there. You'd need your cycle, you need your DBS, you'd need um, all the rest of the kit that you'd bring, but in addition, you'd need your, your notebook, your stopwatch, um, and somebody mentioned about knowledge, but also I would back up that knowledge with, for example, a copy of the Bikeability Delivery Guide, National Standards. Um, great. Uh, next question there, please, Jessica. Um, what do we need to know? What kind of things might we need to know before the session? Any previous observation notes and comments? Yep, that's useful. The address, definitely. <laughs> Make sure you know where you're going. <laughs> Risk assessment, great. You want to see any paperwork relevant to the session. And that could include the register, you know, who's, who's on the course, any... Um, any anything noteworthy um, timetable the activities planned exactly an outline of what what is planned for the session um, great and next thing as well please Jessica what do we need to say so what do we need to uh, yeah school stuff roles and names what else in terms of what we might need to say to the mentee? That we're there to support them, excellent. Um, so we want to put them at ease, I think, is a really key thing, because a lot of people do feel quite nervous about being observed, quite exposed. So we really want them to try and relax as much as possible. So we want to be positive to them. Yeah, it'd be good to let the school know that you're coming as well. Obviously, at the moment, that's a bit of an issue with COVID things. I know some uh, mentors have had issues getting access. Um, 
So yeah, making sure everything's all organised in advance, but we need to say that we're going to be as un unobtrusive as possible. So we're really not going to get involved in the teaching at all, um, unless of course there's any risk involved, but we're going to be, um, you know, positioning ourselves away so we're not in part of the teach um, and that we will be taking notes. That's fine. It will be positive things. Um, and uh, just a record of the session. Um, and also make sure that you've um, uh, uh, encouraged... Make, make sure that you um, organise time for feedback as well for after the session as well with the observation. Um, okay, so uh, can we crack on to the next slide there, please? We're thinking about feedback. So this is a really important part of the mentoring. Um, and it's important to think about how we give good feedback. So if we could pop in a few ideas about how we give good feedback please. So somebody here has put face to face and I think that it's really nice to do feedback face to face. Whether or not it's essential to have to do it face to face if it's not possible. Um, it's kind of open. Uh, I think it is possible to to not do it face to face if that was the only alternative. But I would definitely recommend doing it face to face. I agree that that is definitely the best way to do it. Um, starting off with positives, people are much more open to positivity. And they'll be much more receptive to everything else you say if you start off with the positives. So that's um, a really key point there. Um, asking what they think went well. So it's really important to encourage your um, learner to, or not your, your, your mentee, to think about what went well for them. Like, what do they think? Trying to get them to self-reflect. Um, it's really important to ask them what they think went well. It might not always be something that you agree with, actually. They, it might be that they have um, a different perspective than perhaps what you feel as an outside observer, but it's really important to ask what they, what, how they reflect about their own work. Um, so, clear and specific first questions how do they feel it went yeah that's a good way to start um, be honest really important do you think what do you think you could improve on good so you're asking them what what went well but also what they could improve on so they're the two really important things great thank you somebody has said that they've managed to do it on zoom and it worked well so not necessarily face to face but face to face is nice um Questions to ask equals questions to ask. I'm not sure exactly what that one means. Uh, I guess thinking about what questions to ask. Um, here we're doing it like a sandwich, so being supportive and encouraging, but don't be afraid to address areas to develop. That's really key. We do need to encourage instructors. We need to be positive, but we do need to help them develop as well. So it's really important. I love this here that, David said that you limit it. So we can't give them feedback on absolutely everything. So before you do your session, your feedback session, take a moment to look at your notes and find what are the really key things that you want to draw out of this feedback session. And you might just pick a few points of areas to develop <clears throat> and a, another section of things that um, they've done really well that you want to discuss as well. But yeah, you do have to focus on key points. Um, do it as soon after the session as possible. I would agree definitely within uh, 24 hours. Um, 
the way that I would usually structure it is that we would, I would go and watch a session and then afterwards I'd try and have a feedback, a verbal feedback session with them afterwards. Um, this isn't always possible to do it um, like that, but it's um, a way that I prefer to do it. Um, but certainly you should do your feedback within 24 hours. Um, where am I up to looking through these? Um, give feedback individually and ask if another instructor, ask if another instructor is present if it is shared. Um, so I think what that means here is that if we're giving um, the assessment on one instructor, um, or the, the mentoring for the one ins instructor, we're really focusing on them individually. And it's quite a confidential process as well, because they you, they might discuss things that they've got going on um, and you want them to be able to bring that up. Um, I, I would possibly speak to the other instructor to see how they're experiencing things as well, but I would then allow yourself some private time with your, your mentee. Uh, get a 360 degree view on how you performed as an assessor. These questions are on the IQA form, what went well and areas to be improved. Yes, these questions are on the IQA form. We'll see that in a moment. I'm just going to crack on to the next page, if that's all right, please, Jessica. Oh, I think you've gone backwards. Lovely. So... These things here um, are ideas that I've come up with as well here about feedback. So it's a lot of the things that you've come up with as well. The really key things um, is that it's positive and it is discussion led. Um, so the way that this works is that you might come up with the a few ideas of strengths um, that you want them, um, you're encouraging them to identify through self-reflection. You're also identifying areas of improvement, also by encouraging self-reflection. So you do that by asking lots of questions, rather than just be being told that this is where they could improve. It is so much more powerful if they can come to that conclusion themselves by, by having these ideas drawn out for, from them. So it's um, a really useful method for just encouraging things through questioning. Um, it's also important to ask the learner their thoughts and or um, their thoughts and reasonings. So what I mean by this is that um, maybe you watch them um, them teaching. Maybe they, for example, they there was there was one learner who was always riding in a pair. And you want to ask them afterwards, well, why was this? And try and find out rather than jump into conclusions that, oh, they're doing that, you know, they're picking on that learner, for example. There might be reasonings behind what they're doing. So try and find out their rationale for, for doing what they've done. Um, and bring it into a wider discussion on things and, and give them other ideas of how they could deal with things if that was the case. Um, action plan. Your your role of feedback is also to help them action plan to identify areas of continuous professional development. Ensure that you've got plenty of time to give accurate, concise, and constructive feedback. And like somebody mentioned in the chat, it is so important not to just brush over the areas of development. Um, your mentee wants it as well. They want to be improved. They want to have ideas. They want to develop. So, um, so yeah, include it all. Um, and as we said, make it timely as well. Um, could you pop onto the next slide, please? So these, are, I'm gonna give you a few examples here um, of things that I see often <laughs> when I am observing instructors. So this would be kind of a typical scenario of what I might notice when I'm observing. And I think, hmm, okay. So for example here, learners are always signaling before they turn. So 
I might notice this, that this is how the instructor is teaching. So the kinds of questions I might ask, I might say, I notice that learners always signaled when turning. Is this something that you always encourage them to do? And then I'm opening up a discussion with them. They can tell me yes or no or, or why this happened. Perhaps they don't realise that learners don't always need to signal before they turn. Um, in which case, I'd have my bikeability delivery guide with me and we could discuss it and look at the core documents of, OK, what are these core document documents encouraging? Uh, what should we be doing? How should we be teaching it? So that's one example of the kinds of um, things that come up. Uh, can we go to the next one, please, Jessica? So an instructor is not in the best position for observing the ride or managing the group. So the kind of question I'd ask is, do you think you were in the best position to observe the riders? And where would have been better? So it just allows the um, instructor to start reflecting and think, oh, actually, yeah, perhaps I would have been better positioned somewhere else. I could have seen clearer what was going on. I would have had better risk management in that particular position. So they're coming up with their own conclusions about their be best practice. Uh, next one, please. An instructor is not coming up at junctions to support the other instructor when snaking. So again, the kind of question you might ask is, when you were snaking, you started to leave the junction while your co-instructor was still at the back. Is this something you usually do? How could you ensure that the riders are supported at the junction? Okay, and next one here is learners are not getting optimum amount of time riding. You could ask, did the riders get as much riding time as you'd hoped? How could you have helped them to get more time riding? So it's getting the, again, the instructor to reflect back and think, hmm, maybe this is what I could, could do. And perhaps they come up with ideas and they're like, oh, well, is it possible for me to do this? And you can have a whole discussion about it. It's not about criticising them. It's about trying to help them to, to develop and to find new ways of, of um, doing things. Okay. Um, I noticed that somebody's raised their hand. Is this... Um, right, okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, so, if you do, if you've got a question at all, um, if you could just drop it in the Q and A for us, that'd be that'd be great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so, um, we're just going to have a little talk about um, different forms that get used for observation. Um, it's really important as a mentee to uh, familiarise yourself with the kinds of forms that are being used for you, but also as a mentor as well, it's really, really essential that you know what the forms look like so that you can prepare yourself and make sure that you're looking out for specific um, points from them. These are just a few of the forms which are available. Um, and I believe that when um, Bikeability Trust put this webinar up on their website, they will also include link to forms like such as these. So um, we've got a task 10 form for new instructors. This is probably a form which most of you haven't seen unless you've done the new uh, level two first for sports um, award for cycling instructors. Um, I'm gonna be showing that in a minute because it's actually a really useful form for everybody to be using. Um, there's the IQA observation form, which you should all be familiar with, even if you're not familiar with. So we'll have another little look at that. Um, there's <clears throat> also other forms which you will um, get involved with. Um, for example, the recognised prior learning practical assessment form. So 
for those of you who need to convert your qualification over to first for sports um, that's your your assessment form which gets used again I would just really encourage you to look at that form so you know the kinds of criteria that the uh, mentor and observer is looking at and then um, there's also post-course assessment forms for those of you who are on the first for sport um, courses already okay so um, let's crack on to the next one please Jessica um, so this is a task 10 form used for new instructors um, on the first for sport um, qualification level two um, and so right from the very first day um, instructors or new instructors training instructors are being encouraged to reflect and they're expected to reflect what went well and what could be improved so these are the two questions which are continuously being asked all the time what went well what could be improved and this um, form is used um, to peer review with another instructor so um, you can see the different categories here of planning of the session, delivery of the session, participant progress and overall effectiveness of the session in achieving the learning outcomes. So um, um, this form is used um, when new instructors are training um, and they have to upload it afterwards as part of their e-portfolio for First for Sport. Um, but as a tutor, we also encourage in, uh, these new instructors when they get to their places of work that they start using these forms as well to help them to continue to develop. So even more experienced instructors may start to see this form being used by new instructors who have been encouraged to peer review with more experienced instructors so if you start seeing these forms around encourage people to use them and I would strongly encourage you to just be using it as part of your your own development somebody's so I'm just going to see this chat question here um is it possible to see all the task forms um I think that that is a, do you mean, do you want to see all the tasks for the whole of the level two course? Because I don't think you really would want to, unless you've got a specific reason to. Um, I'm just sharing you this form because it's the most relevant one um, regarding mentoring. So I'm, I'm putting this one on here for now. Um, yeah, uh, so the first sport one there is, is a great example. Um, but the yeah, if you if you wanted to, um, obviously everyone's welcome to work with first support to look to apply to become an RDC, and, and the forms are available there. But um, certainly at the trust, we're, we're not going to be sharing them all through our, our channels uh, as they are first support documents. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, but this is a really great um, kind of form that you could use for. Um, so less formal so more informal peer review okay um, can we have a look at the next form please the next one we're going to talk about um, bikeability IQA internal quality assurance instructor observation form so this is quite a long form okay so I'm going to just show you a couple of sections for from it so we've already mentioned that each instructor should receive as a minimum, and it is very much a minimum, one observation a year. Scoring should be used to guide professional development plans, not as a formal appraisal tool. So on this form, there is kind of scoring for each for the instructor being mentored. Um, we'll take a look at that in a moment, okay? So if you could... Um, move us on here so again we're becoming really familiar with this what went well areas to be improved so always just reflecting back and it's the instructor who might be commenting on these two things <clears throat> and then also the observer as well will be commenting on these things 
And as somebody's already mentioned, keep it um, relatively brief. You know, <clears throat> you might be observing and think of a whole load of things <laughs> that you think that they could, uh, that they've done brilliantly and also that they could, could be improved. Um, just try and keep it as kind of succinct as possible. Um, so I generally say about free free items is good there. And then also um, let's not forget about action plans because that again is a key uh, feature as well these days. Um, thinking about um, how people could develop and continue to develop. Um, can we have the next part of it as well? So this is an example of an area from the form where you've got the scoring. Um, I've also, I've picked this area here because this is this reproc um, and it's to do with the principles in, de in delivery. It's all linked back to the bikeability delivery guide. And there are quite a lot of forms which go back to these reproc ideas, this realistic, empowering, positive, progressive, rider-led, outcome-orientated and continuous assessment uh, principles. Um, so, so these come up again and again. And for example, if you're doing um, an RPL assessment as well, these are the same themes that come back again and again. Um, so here you then scored even not evident improvement needed, satisfactory or excellent. Okay, and actually you're supposed to write the score, which I haven't written in this bit here. And then you um, write your evidence for it. So what's your reasoning for given, giving this score? What comments would you put about what you've observed? <coughs> okay, I think let's move on. So um, we've spoken a lot about what makes a good mentor, but on the flip side, what makes a good mentee? Um, we will all be mentees at, at various points and times. Um, some mentees are a lot more open to things than others. So if you could, if you put your thoughts and ideas in the chat again about what makes a good mentee, thank you. Someone who is willing to listen and learn. Absolutely, they've got to be open to learning and listening. <laughs> Someone who can self-reflect, excellent, yep. Keen and positive. Yeah, they've got to want it. If they don't want to be learning, if they don't want to be developing, then it's gonna be hard for them to take things and new ideas on board. Um, there is aspiring to improve, good not too defensive now this is really key because I have seen it before where people do get defensive as positive as you may put things forward people can feel challenged if they feel that they're already doing something really good and then you come along and suggest something different or help them to suggest something different so um yeah Okay, I'm just getting uh... great. Being aware that it was supposed to take place, it sounds like that that's somebody's experience that they had a, <laughs> a mentee who wasn't aware that it was happening. So yeah, somebody who's organised enough to know what's going on. Great. Um, could you move us on to the next slide, please, Jessica? Great. So again, I've put really similar things here that they're willing to learn, self-reflect, discuss, that they listen as well. And one key thing here that I don't think anybody picked up on, but that they're, they're willing to share their experiences with honesty, that they're willing to say, yeah, I do struggle with this. How could I do it better? Um, and to be able to discuss things um, is they will improve as you know as much as possible if they can be as on, honest and possible and um and sort of open up their vulnerabilities i suppose um so 
yeah, there there can be a tendency for mentees to be a bit defensive. But if you can be like this and be a good mentee, then you will get so much from it. Um, if we move on to the next one. So we're coming towards the end here. And so hopefully we've ident identified the benefits of mentoring. So you've seen and you know, I think already at the beginning, you were all quite open to seeing that there are lots of benefits of mentoring, but we've gone further into looking into what it looks like and who might mentor as well. So, and it seems that a lot of you um, potentially could consider becoming mentors as well, if that opportunity arises. Um, and we've also discussed how to make it a positive and valuable experience. Um, so what have we learned from the polls and chats? I think we've learned that um, people can see the benefits of mentoring. People certainly in the last year haven't been mentored and observed as much as they should have been. I think that also in, especially regards to more formal written um, mentoring, that definitely more should be happening. I think also in terms of... Um, more informal, just developing the culture of um, peer review and just opening up a space for discussion to help you improve and develop is a really powerful and important thing to do. And so even something basic, such as having that question at the end of, you know, your, your register or whatever paperwork you might have, where you can just say at the end to get the, the instructors to self-reflect and think what went well, what could be improved is a really important um, space to open up for people to discuss things. Um, so I just want you to think as well, just in your own minds, I don't need to see it all, but just think, how could your work support instructors more? So is there any action points that you're taking away from this that you're thinking, yeah, okay, actually, I think that this is what we should be doing. Right. Next slide, please. And thank you. And any questions at the end? So we've got about five minutes left on the session. Um, thank you, Wendy, for your presentation. We're happy to overrun um, if there's more questions that come up. Um, but we've got a few in the chat and um, we, we'll probably finish just on time. But if you have got any questions that haven't yet been answered, please just pop those in the Q&A and I will leave it to uh, Wendy, Patrick and Benjamin to tackle some of the questions which are there currently. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jess. Oops, sorry, just muted myself by accident. Um, uh, Wendy, question from Mike Jones about uh, what's your thoughts on standing watching with a notebook and pen? Um, um, I think it's a lot better than a phone, personally, um, which has, uh, you know, been commented on before. Um, I, I explain always beforehand that I need to make notes because otherwise I'm going to forget what I've watched. It's really essential that you do make notes. So my my thoughts are that yes it's fine the the one issue is rain yes yeah no good good point you do need to make, make notes somewhere because none of us can remember everything yeah. um another one from uh from mike about uh instructors i think it's relates to a little bit early in the presentation about um instructor might feel nervous and you might not get the full the true reflection yeah. of yeah. the instructor um, absolutely yeah so um i spoke before like when when um, doing the feedback, you, you know, often the question I ask is, is this how you usually do it? You know, for example, in those examples, we we said about, you know, when you're snaking, is this how you usually do it? Um, try and find out what is more normal for them. For example, they might not be as relaxed as normal. So the longer that you're there for observing, hopefully the more they'll feel relaxed. Also, the more frequently you do observations, the more relaxed they'll be the more positive and friendly you are, the more relaxed they'll be. Um, so all these can help to make them feel less nervous. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, often people will be nervous, but I think if you, um, 
if you try and make it as comfortable as possible and try and understand um, and have a, you know, you can kind of, you, it's the best you can do. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, one from Hilary about uh, the forms, filling them in on the spot or take it home um, uh, and do it, put it later. Yeah. Interesting. The way that I would do it normally is I make notes first, I do the feedback and then I fill it in. But other people might have different ways of doing it. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. Um, but the IQA form in particular is quite a long form. So to be able to expect to fill it in before you do the feedback could be quite difficult. So um, so that's just the way that I would usually do it. Great. Okay. Uh, another, you go for it. Yeah. Go on. Um, no, no, oh, sorry, there was a question, question from Carol from earlier, Wendy, which is about the wheel time calculation. Oh, how yeah, you, of course. Sorry. Yeah, I think just the best thing just is with the stopwatch, you know, like with like keeping an eye on the time. And that's why with um, the be, being familiar with the forms, you know, then in advance what you're looking out for. So um, I do find that one quite a hard one on that form because um yeah you are supposed to be you know timing it um other forms you just have kind of more of a general idea about you know percentage of time riding and it gives you know you can have more of a just a general flavor about it but yeah for the iqa form it is literally with with a watch you should be watching it Great. Uh, one from Kate about the, the forms again. Um, so at the moment, the IQA forms are available on the um, Trust website um, and the the First Sport one is available to RDC through through First Sport. Um, we have obviously comments and uh, suggested revisions to uh, any forms that we put out are, um, are, are welcome. And um, if it was felt that that's something similar to the first support form would be helpful uh, for all training providers then we can certainly look to to do something there uh for you um a question from peter for you wendy were you a mentor mm -hmm. before you came a level three um tutor mm -hmm. no i don't think i was um but i would now definitely encourage it i think it would be a really good step before um becoming a level three tutor um to become like an IQA lead within your um, training provider, if that's a possibility for you, I think that that would bridge a really nice, you know, bridge it really nicely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And, and another one from Kate. Um, should an instructor's mentor be a different person uh, to their observer? Do you want to talk, talk about that one a little bit? Um, well, Yes and it's no. Big, 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 it depends, I guess. But yeah, it, it depends. I personally think that ideally it would be the same person because um, the IQA is just like an internal um, observation. It's there to offer support and guidance. As somebody said earlier, you know, um, you, you might not be they might feel um, more nervous. You might not get the true picture. The more that that um, person observes and sees them the more relaxed that they will be and so um yeah i think that um it's at absolutely fine to be the observer and and the mentor i think you know a mentor needs to observe that the two things are tied together um so um so yeah i i i think that that definitely could be the same person We've got a couple more comments in the chat. Um, we tend to, sorry, in the Q and A, we tend to use level threes as mentors, but I like the idea of instructors being informal mentors from Peter. Thank you. Great, uh, and one about Liz, about um, a comment from something was mentioned last week about uh, recording sessions to refer back to timings. Um, um, and you should be getting parental permission to film. Yeah, I mean, if if of course, if you were um, taking any film or video, you you would absolutely need um, the parents to understand what was happening and um, and to get full permission first if that's what you wanted to, to do. Um, although perhaps a stopwatch and making notes uh, on your um, paperwork or wherever you're recording might might be a slightly easier uh, approach. 
So we've got a couple more comments still coming in. And before, before we closed, I wanted to say a massive thank you to Wendy, really, because Wendy's worked incredibly hard on this um, session and it's been incredibly thorough as well. Um, the listening and the asking questions, which is what mentoring is largely about, has been uh, consistent through the whole presentation. And so, you know, in a similar way to last last two or three weeks, the, the uh, engagement's been fantastic and that's largely credit to Wendy, but also thanks to all of you out there as well. So mm -hmm. thanks for that. Yep, um, so is there anything else that you would like to say, Benjamin, before we wrap up? Oh, I just had to, had to mute myself. Um, a couple more questions about the, the task 10 uh form um uh, so clearly that's that, that's that's been really well received um so uh, we can certainly look to um either create something similar um or or or, or receive permission from first support to, to share more, more widely um i want from carol uh, about recommending peer mentors to use a different form uh to the iqa form um uh, <laughs> Good. What would you suggest, Emily? Um, Emily, uh, Wendy. <laughs> um, well, the IQA form is designed so that you're observing separately. You're not peer. You're not co-teaching when you use it. It's just too detailed a form, you know, um, to be using as a co-instructor. So I wouldn't recommend using it if that's what you mean by the peer mentoring there. Um, but in terms of if it's um, another instructor who's going out watching um, another instructor just more informally, yeah, you could use that form as a guide. I don't see why not. Great, thank you. Um, no more questions in the chat uh, Q&A that I can see. Um, so yeah, Jessica, over, right. over to you. And of course, if you do have any questions um, or you want to chat in any more detail, you can see Wendy's contact details on the screen. And also you can always message us uh, using contact us at bikeabilitytrust.org. Uh, um, so we uh, yeah, are there on hand to support with that. This recording will be available on the website shortly. We'll make sure that we link to the IQA form um, on that as well. So if you've not managed to find that yet, then it will be accompanying this recording. And again, as I say every week, when we end this session in a moment, if you could take just a couple of minutes to fill in our survey, that would be really valuable. It helps us give feedback to Wendy, but also give feedback uh, to the trust and help us inform what we do for future sessions. And um, so, yes, thanks again to OMD for such a uh, comprehensive and great session. And we hope that you found it useful and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>